All right, so find yourself in a comfortable seat. You can rest the hands on the knees or in the lap. Thanks for all the thumbs up. And find a nice straight tall spine. And regardless of whatever obstacles have been presented to you so far today, see if we can just let those kind of go. You can even envision them just like melting away. Maybe through the root into the earth to be burned up at the earth's core. Just allowing all those distractions, maybe the heaviness of anything that's arisen today to just release. You can rest the hands heavy, maybe close the eyes or drop the gaze. And just checking in with the breath, noticing anything there is to notice in your body today. When you're ready, you can take a big breath in maybe to a count of three, feeling yourself at full lungs, and then exhale, let it go. We're gonna take two more in whatever way best suits you, just taking a big breath in. You can observe the lungs expanding, front and back body. Biggest breath yet, and then exhale, letting it go. Observing the lungs return to neutral. Taking one more breath at your own pace, breathing in and letting go. Noticing your body on the earth once again, you might wiggle through fingers and toes, roll the shoulders, Maybe even take a big stretch, reawaken the body, any other movement that suits you. I see some head rolls, some side to side twisting, go for it. And as always, any movement you feel inclined to take during this session, you can move your body as needed. Thank you. So taking a moment to welcome Dr. Lou Casalino, who's joining us from somewhere around Westchester. And Dr. Casalino has a diverse clinical and research repertoire. He holds degrees in philosophy, theology, and clinical psychology. His interests are in the areas of the synthesis of neuroscience with psychotherapy, education, management, and leadership. He is the author of only 10 books, <laughs> including The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, The Neuroscience of Human Relationships, Timeless, Attachment-Based Teaching, The Making of a Therapist, and Why Therapy Works. He has also authored and co-authored articles and book chapters on child abuse, schizophrenia, education, language, and cognition. Dr. Casalino lectures around the world on brain development, evolution, and psychotherapy, and maintains a both clinical and consulting practice here in LA. I know we have a lot of Masters of Yoga Studies students here who are writing their thesis on issues that might relate to psychosomatics and neuroscience and therapeutic applications um, among many uh, great scholars here interested, all of you. So thank you so much, Dr. Casalino, for joining us. Uh, you can take the floor. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking out the time for this Wednesday night lecture on Tuesday night. And um, we've had some electrical problems here in Westchester, and I was happy to keep my power. But Dr. Chapel is uh, via telephone, I think. I don't know if he'll be able to share anything with us via phone, but hopefully sometime this evening. Um, anyway, what I, I wanted to talk tonight about um, the construction of experience. And as you heard, my background is a, is a combination of philosophical, theological, psychotherapeutic, uh, neuroscience. Uh, I can never really make a decision about what field to be in. So I just keep studying more and more things. And um, it, I'm happy that, that it worked out that way because as time has gone on and as I've had the ability to sit with a variety of different perspectives, um, they've over time began more and more to dovetail and interconnect and create a synergy in, in my own thinking. And so it's, uh, it's sort of with pleasure now that instead of feeling like I can't make a commitment 
to a particular field, feeling more now like it um, being in a position where after all these years, I can sort of bring things together um, is very gratifying. So I, I appreciate your interest and um, your, uh, your involvement and your interaction. Um, just, just so you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly attached to my slides or to my ideas or to speaking the entire time. And so whoever of you is involved and wants to interact and ask questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. And um, I always find that the, the, the lectures are much more interesting for me and for everyone when, when people are involved in talking um, about uh, whatever comes up. So I just wanna give you that invitation and I hope some of you uh, decide to take me up on that. I'm gonna try to share my screen now, see if that works. It looks like it will work. All right. So here we go. I've got on my uh, back, my laptop, you can see, I don't know if you can see Bernie Sanders back there on the boat. Oh, you can't see that. Okay, never mind. I have a screensaver. Right? Yeah, I, I love those Bernie Sanders pictures all over the place. So I have as a screensaver, the one where he's uh, crossing the Delaware in the boat with his mittens on and all. So, uh, sorry that you can't see that. It's very cute. All right, so um, ever since I was very young, I would say probably seven or eight or nine years old, growing up in my crazy Italian family um, and feeling like I had been accidentally dropped there from another planet because it was so, I was uh, struggled so much to try to understand what people were doing and why and why I thought the way as I thought and why other people thought the way they thought. So I think from very early on, I sort of, I started reading science fiction and literature and just about everything. Um, trying to discover someone who I could communicate with and relate to, because I, I felt like I lived uh, with an alien species at my house. I don't know if any of you have shared that experience with me. But um, so very early in life, I started uh, searching for explanations. And for, I think the biggest question in my mind was always, why do people, why do people, I, you know, why do we, why do I, um, why, why am I so confused? Why is life so painful? Why is there so much suffering that I experience and the people around me? And so in a sense, the thing that ties together all of these uh, different areas that I've studied is really the, um, has been the attempt to understand how is our experience, how does our experience arise? And so um, there are many, many different ways to approach it and um, I think very early on, way before I studied neuroscience, I studied Buddhism. And Buddhism was a very interesting way to think about, um, you know, Buddhist philosophy has a very interesting construct about the uh, construction of experience. And um, that was one of the early uh, ways I understood it that really stuck with me through my experience in neuroscience. And what I've dis discovered more and more over the last decade or two is how much recent or more current neuroscience theory is supporting Buddhist theory. And it's amazing to me how through a kind of analytic introspection that uh, you know, uh, Buddhist meditators have had for a couple of thousand of years and also the types of work William James and other early psychologists did who uh, valued introspection, how our understanding and the knowledge uh, bases are starting to come together and uh, the fact that you can do empirical research and discover something that very closely uh, resembles what we come up what we come upon with introspection is just fascinating and so um, I guess the, uh, as an introduction I don't feel uh, I wouldn't ask any of you to take any of these ideas over the other I think um, all of it, neuroscience Buddhism psychology in general yoga the variety of different practices, uh, many roads, I, I guess I say, to the same awareness, to the same consciousness. So my goal really is to just give you additional ways to think about it, certainly not to talk you out of anything you've already discovered that makes sense and works for you. So let me just start with, uh, with a couple of quotes, I think, that set the stage for me. This is from John Steinbeck. Um, uh, one of his last books, was written by um, by Steinbeck. He he got a, he bought a camper van and took his standard poodle and went driving around the country, and wrote this book called Travels with Charlie, who was his poodle. 
And it was really a time in his life where he engaged in a lot of self-reflection um, and uh, sort of reflecting back on his life. And one of the, the uh, conclusions he came to is that external reality has a way of being not so external after all. It turns out to be the macrocosm of microcosm me. And embedded in this is the fact, I think that um, what, what we experience outside of us is in large part a construction that our brains evolved to organize their experience for the purpose of survival. And so we live in a very egocentric frame of mind. We, like as Nietzsche said, um, the center is everywhere. And what he meant by that is we all construct our universes from our egocentric perspective. It doesn't mean we can't gain empathy and attunement and uh, see the world, at least theoretically from other people's perspectives, but just in natural day-to-day -day life, we construct the world based on our own experiences and our own perspective. And it's one of the, um, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful thing in that we can create a rich inner universe. And it's a challenging thing in that we embody all of the biases and prejudices of our individual experiences. And for, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges now in this experiment we call democracy and a pluralistic society is how do we get out of our ego, you know, our egocentrism and be able to be, be able to pass the gap or, or go across the gap to other people and see the world from their experience and be able to internalize that and expand our sense of self to include those around us. Another wonderful quote, I think that sets some of the groundwork is between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our personal freedom. So what, what Frankel's quote suggests is that our brains respond very, very quickly based on past experience, based on bias, based on our biochemistry and our biology, right? And it takes, and we'll talk about this more later, it takes about half a second for our conscious minds to be aware of what our bodies have already experienced. So there's this half a second gap between sensation and perception. And in that half a second gap, our brains create our experience. And so I think one of the things that is, that is shared both in Buddhist meditation and in psychotherapy is this idea of exploring that gap. Another way to talk about it would be the architecture of our neural networks involved with early learning, or Freud might say it would be the architecture of our unconscious. But in that exploration, to discover what, how we have we been organized, how have we been um, sort of propelled to survive on the planet, and then how do we become conscious of those things? And so we've had, I was having a discussion in a class last week about free will. And what the neuroscience suggests is that we don't really have free will. What we have is free won't, right? We're able to, um, we, we, in a sense, have all sorts of reactions that are spontaneous and that we can teach, we can train ourselves out of through focused study or through meditation or through psychotherapy. But what, we, what we're doing is we have to come to accept ourselves, the fact that this is the way our brains work and that we have these responses before they're subject to our ability to reflect on them. And then we have to make conscious decisions about right behavior, about right mindfulness, about you know correct action. So from the perspective of neuroscience, we don't really know yet from a scientific perspective how the brain, how our brains construct consciousness. Assuming that the brain is required for consciousness, I think that uh, you know 30 or 40 years ago when I started studying psychology, it wasn't that clear that um, that there was a lot of different opinion about whether consciousness actually existed in the body or not. You know, it was sort of that uh, Descartes notion of the spirit in the machine where our soul comes into the body and we experience 
awareness through our soul. And then when we die, the soul leaves. But I think what's happened, and I don't, I guess for better or for worse, it's just the, the thrust of neuroscience is that the general belief is that the consciousness arises from the brain and that it's the result of multiple neurobiological processes, but we don't quite understand how all of those things work. The best guess that we have is that our moment to moment experience is a kind of um, emergent phenomena or epiphenomena of uh, things like attention, working memory, language, learned behaviors, all of these things that kind of make up or, or, or sew together a fabric of our moment to moment awareness. And as you all know, our moment to moment awareness is not that consistent, is not necessarily that predictable. Um, it's subject to a lot of different things, chemicals, moods, mental distress, all sorts of things, stress itself. And so there's still a lot to be discovered about this, but scientists, there's no, a lot of scientists have theories, but nothing that, uh, that knocks me out that I would share with a lot of confidence. Okay. So in thinking, I mentioned before about the time between sensation and perception. Sensation is when you're, when you actually study someone's brain, right? You can see that primitive parts of the brain, um, parts deep in the, in the core of the brain related to sensation and, and, uh, input from the, from the body or from the outside world results in, a in an electrochemical activation in about 50 milliseconds after, the, after something's triggered inside, okay? And then, like I said before, there's a, a bunch of, uh, of activation that occurs, a whole lot of activation across a variety of neural networks that then reach the cortex. And the cortex is what allows us to have a conscious awareness of something taking place. So again, about 50 milliseconds uh, between when we're stimulated from the outside, we know, and when the primitive parts of our brain become activated and about 500 milliseconds where all of those connections combine to stimulate our cortex and our conscious awareness. Okay. So in this half second, right, um, there is a lot going on. If, if you ever, if you do a Google search and you put in what's the most popular Google search, probably, um, I don't know, uh, so, uh, if you type in Kardashian and you print, you press search, right? You're going to find something in the upper right-hand corner of something like a hundred billion results in 0 0.003 seconds, right? The brain, I don't know if you can compare the brain's operating speed to Google, but the brain and Google work much faster than we're capable of comprehending, right? And so we might ask the question, well, how is it that in that half a second, so much of our learning history and our past and everything, it constructs our experience of the present moment? And simply the, the answer is that is because of the processing speed. We talk about, um, I remember Ram Das. remember Ram Das talked about be here now, well, from a, from a neurobiological process, we're not capable of being here now. We're capable of being here just about now. We're capable of being half a second behind now, right? And in that half second, our brains construct our experience of reality. So a lot happens in that half second. And in, uh, in fact, um, one of the things that's an interesting sort of factoid to have from neuroscience is that 90%, if, if you study the cortex, 90% of the cortex, of the neurons in the cortex are connected and, and communicating with other neurons in the cortex. In other words, they're not involved in processing sensory input. They're involved in, in analyzing and combining and combining present experience with past experience, right? So you might be able to make this a general, very general, probably incorrect statement, but a ballpark estimate that about 90% of our brain processing is not about what we're experiencing out in the world. It's about how our brain is constructing the experience of it. Because when you think about what the purpose of a brain is, I mean, why do we have brains, right? We have brains in order to predict and control our environment. If you see, um, you know, if, if you look at, at animals and evolution, and I, 
I assume we we are an animal in that in that lineage. That um, the, the more um, the more sophisticated brains are, the more adaptable any animal is to its environment, and the higher its probability of survival. Okay, so what all of this processing and a processing about is all about prediction and control. So think about Buddhism and what Buddha said. You know, we spend our time worrying about the future and regretting the past. Right. And so we'll talk about this later, the difference between pain and suffering, right? Pain is a natural part of life, but Buddha talked about suffering as something that's created in our minds. And so in this 90% of internal processing, again, just as a, as a heuristic, our brains are creating all of these things that make us worry, that cause us distress and, and the process of predicting what's going on in our world. So one of the things that um, that's important to be thinking about then is this, this um, third piece is that early unconscious learning, especially from childhood, right, guides our attention and shapes our perception. So during our early years, the infrastructure of our brains and our minds and how our brains process information and how we consciously think about things is organized, okay? And um, the humans are the most dependent of all species. Like in, uh, if you've ever seen those, those nature shows where the giraffe is born, it drops onto the ground. Um, other giraffes come around, lick on it for a while. And in a few minutes, the giraffe is up and walking around and they're moving on to the next tree, right? But with humans, we have a child and um, basically the fetus isn't even um, viable until it graduates from graduate school. So we have children, we have them for 20 years, you know, 25 years. I can't tell you how many clients I work with whose kids are in their thirties still living in the house. They can't get rid of them, okay? So not that that's a bad thing necessarily, but I'm saying that we're different from giraffes, okay? So one of the things about the human brain is the human brain, the job of the human brain is to adapt to the environment. And our major environment as a child are our parents and our families. And as a child, because we don't really understand consciously what's going on, we understand emotionally what's going on, really the, the largest uh, shape, the, the largest shaping mechanisms in our childhood are our parents' unconscious, right? So we're actually living and adapting to our parents' childhood and their parents' childhoods, right? And so we all live in this multi-generational reality. And I can't tell you how many of my clients um, have symptoms that make no sense given their experience, but make complete sense given their parents' experience and their grandparents' experiences. So I think whenever um, one, of the, one of the shortcomings I think of psychotherapy is the focus on the individual, apart from the multi-generational family system um, and, and, you know, and immigration, prejudice, you know, all of the trials and tribulations that my ancestors went through, and I'm sure many of yours did as well. All of these things become part of how they view the world, right? And so um, the, the important thing to think about this though is our brains are being shaped early in life to adapt to our families. And I think for all of us, there are ways in which, like, let me, let me take that back. For many of us, the ways in which our families live may not be the best fit for us. We're searching for something different. Not that we wanna reject everything about them, but we need something different. Yet when we go out into life, we discover that we tend to almost, we have a tendency to recreate those things that we're trying to escape. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they say, you know, people try to make geographical interventions, right? So they move, they move someplace hoping to escape their demons, but all the demons come, right? Their baggage comes with them, okay? And so one of the things you see in, um, in Freudian psychoanalysis is this thing, um, what he called repetition compulsion, right? And what Freud said about this was that um, people, if, if people have um, conflict or, or, or trauma or distress about something, they keep recreating it with, with the goal or the desire to kind of cure themselves. And that might be true, from a neuroscience perspective, how this would be sort of modified is that what happens during childhood is our brains learn 
to survive in a certain reality. And what we do very often, if we're not conscious, is we create, recreate that reality because that's the reality our brain developed to adapt to. Okay, so we do tend to repeat distress or problem situations or the types of relationships or the problems we're having either with our love or our work, those things tend to repeat themselves for some of us, especially early in life before we, bef when we have to get to the point where we stop blaming all the other people in our lives and we realize I'm the common factor across all of these situations, right? And that really is, you know, it goes to repetition compulsion, but it also goes to the fact that our behaviors and the people we choose and the way we interact with people um, really reflect the early strategies of survival that are held within our brains that in that, you know, that uh, 500 milliseconds recreate our expectations of the world, what we expect from other people, uh, what we expect from ourselves, what we think of ourselves, right? Our ego, our self-esteem, how much shame we carry, all of those things are embedded in our, in our you know, implicit memory systems and get activated in that 500 milliseconds and color everything we do, okay? So the, a really important thing, at least from a psychotherapeutic point of view, and I'm sure from many other perspectives as well, is that none of this makes sense if you don't account for that half second, right? If you think you're living in the moment, then there's no true explanation for why you do what you do or why our childhoods have such an impact on our moment to moment experience. If you accept that model of that half a second and within that half a second creating our reality, then you know psychological explanations make sense and psychotherapy as a process makes sense. I'm just curious, does anyone have any questions at this point before I go on? I yeah, do. I, I, I put them up on chat, a few of them. Okay, um, is there someone who wants to look at the questions and, or would you rather just uh, speak up and ask them yourselves? I said, well, doesn't our reality prevent us from, I mean, doesn't our experiences prevent us from seeing reality? Like looking through a dirty tinted glass with a dirty window in front of us and a dirty screen. And no, it sounds like my cousin Vinny. Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> I use that uh -huh. example all the time. <laughs> right. Well, well, I think I think we're really t we may be using different metaphors for the same thing, right? Like I guess what I'm what I'm saying is that the way our brain that the organization of our brain, if we're not if we're not, um, I guess I'd say if we're still fighting old battles or we're still hung up in trauma or 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 neurotic conflict, for, using Freud's words, um, that's the dirty screen with the dirty window with, you know, looking at, 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 you know, through bad eyes, there's, we're not really capable of having random perceptions, right? The perceptions that we have are biased and, and structured by our brains. And they're not accidental or random. What they are are reflections of our history. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So that, with regard to that, and I've like our brains fill in the blanks from experience from what we don't see. Right. Because we are not like a video camera where a video camera gets everything. Right. We only see part of the picture and a lot of it's clouded through those, that dirty window and our brain fills in the rest of the spots. Right. And, and when you think, you know, one way to think about therapy or meditation practice, yoga, whatever, whatever you do to become more self-aware and more clear is you're cleaning, you're trying to get that window a little cleaner. You know, you're, you're trying to add a little less, especially negative spin or self-destructive spin to how you're, you're creating your reality. Yeah, well, that's prejudice is um, whether it's you know, race, religion or um, God knows what it is. But that's all something that's from experience. A lot of it comes from parents. And and that's why we if you were, we were just dropped in the middle of something we would have no prejudice if we didn't have all our experiences behind us. Right, right. Yeah, and I think this is really an important way to understand it also to put in context prejudice. Just a, a very simple example is a, I have a, 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 a African-American woman as a client 
and she was pulled over by the police. And she was really describing the trauma of that for her. And when uh, they made some mistake on her registration, so when they ran her plates, her car came up as registered incorrectly. And so they pull, they follow her into a Starbucks parking lot and they, you know, they, uh, they call for backup. So she's having a panic attack because all she knows in her life is what can happen to, you know, Africa. And if I was in that situation, I would just be pissed off and annoyed, right? But she was terrified. And so if, if she and I were having, are having the exact same experience, I really can't understand her experience from my, based on my perspective. I have to learn from her what that means from her. And that half a second, her experience, her ethnicity, her, you know, whatever's going on with her, what she's seen on television and how she relates to it is all going to, uh, is, is going to create that experience for her, which would be quite different from mine. You know, earlier you talked about um, that half second and um, how the electrochemicals and all react. Well, what um, I think I see. I think we react to sensation, and I think anything we see, hear, do, or smell causes a sensation, and that's what we react to. And that half a second you're talking about, if we could take that half second and not react. And, and allow it to go on. So realizing that, you know, all right, it's only a sensation I'm reacting to, not what's actually happening. And it's, and I can make the sensation go away if I don't react to it. Yeah, that's one, yeah, that's, that's free won't, right? That's your ability to make a decision about what is getting activated in your body. Right. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah, I'm just curious, any, does anyone else have any other questions? I did have a question, if I could. Uh-huh, Kayla? Um, yeah, Kayla, hi, hi, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, so going back to what you had, uh, you were saying about a parent's experience and how then we can experience, I just wanted to make sure I understand, and I see on the screen here, the early unconscious learning guides, but does mm -hmm. that also apply to, um, like, are you saying that they could have experiences that we may not even know about, but they still sort of color the people we are? Um, let's see. Well, they, they can have experiences that they might not tell you about. In other words, they may not tell you the story. Yes. But the effects of that story emotionally, psychologically, relationally is part of what gets communicated to you in a thousand different ways over many years, mm. right? And so, if your parents escaped oppression, or, or you know, or I've I've worked with many, many uh, you know Holocaust survivors and grew up in a in a neighborhood with Holocaust survivors in New York, and um, the you know what we've seen and there's plenty of research you know that's showing the the, the second generation, third generation Holocaust survivors have a number of post-traumatic reactions and attitudes towards the world that weren't, that really aren't direct, directed to any of their experiences, mm -hmm. right? But that they picked up through their parents' attitude. And think about when you're, you know, when you're, when you're six months old and you're interacting with your, with your parents, you don't understand what they're saying. What you're understanding, what you feel is their emotion you feel their ease or dis-ease, their fear or their sense of safety. And that gives you, a, along with you know, thousands of other things, shapes mostly your right hemisphere during that first year to create the emotional background, like the emotional soundtrack to your life. Mm -hmm. So for the, you know, you might think, well, I'm the type of person that thinks the, half, the glass is half full rather than half empty. Well, where does that sort of background affect come from? probably thousands of different experiences during childhood where you absorb this expectation of things working out and being okay, and they were, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're, if uh, a lot of the Holocaust survivors I worked with, um, you know, they always caution their children not to trust, not to trust Catholics, for example, because of their experiences back in Europe, or they always kept money somewhere hidden in the house in case they have to flee in the night. Right. And so when you when you grow up with that sort of a background affect, 
um, even though nothing ever, you know, you've never had to flee in the middle of the night, your, your psyche absorbs that and you've got this sort of soundtrack that colors everything you experience. Yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? Thank you. Yeah, it does. It's, um, it's really interesting. Actually, today I had a conversation with my mom and she, out of the blue, shared something with me she never had before. Mm -hmm. And it was a personal trauma of hers from her childhood. And mm -hmm. it was really interesting because I, it, it's something that I related to, but we don't know each other's stories as mother daughter. So mm -hmm. this is really interesting and, and timely. So yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, yeah, so, you know, just my guess would be that that story that you heard consciously for the first time, you've actually, you've actually had inside of you mm -hmm. your whole life. Yeah. And so you're hearing it said, and you have, there's an opportunity now for, to integrate your conscious awareness and your narrative memory, right? And also your self identity with these emotions or sensations or feelings you've had in the past that you really didn't have a name for, or you had to discover and you felt they were a part of yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was talking about before. Uh, so many of my clients um, over time have discovered that some of the things that they struggle with are theirs and other things have been implanted, you know, through resonance, through um, identification, through imitation and mirror neurons and emotional attunement. Emotions are contagious, depression, anxiety, you know, uh, affection, attention, love, those things go across the, I call it the social synapse using, a, you know, the neuroscience metaphor. And we absorb, we absorb them and we, disc we think they're our own because we've never heard them said, but they're, they're a part of our unthought known, which I, I love that term. We have an unthought known, those things that we've absorbed through our bodies and through our emotions, but we've never named, but we know they're absolutely true. We just don't know how to talk about them. Mm-hmm. I saw someone's hand was raised, but then that little thing went away on my screen. So whoever has their hand raised, please uh, say hi. I have a question for you, Dr. Can you? Oh, do you can you say something about genetic memory for lack of another term? Um, let's see. It's it's um, rather than rather than learned from our parents and our family. Yeah, I think that is something there. Um, there certainly is. We have species memory, right? For example, um, like children, if a mom bears their, their bears her teeth to a young baby, the child will have a fear reaction because bared teeth they're stored in the, our very primitive brain as an expression of danger, right? So there are ways in which we have this genetic memory that, well, I should say this inherited memory, and it's based on the way our brains and the architecture of our neural networks get organized. But it, it, if you're talking about genetic memory, in other words, getting inheriting memory from one generation to the next, I think that is, um, that's, that's really not clear how that, um, you know, how that would take place. There are certainly biochemical changes and genetic changes. That's a field called epigenetics that can be um, translated down to the next generation. But you'd really have to be, you'd have to carefully define what you need, mean by memory, right? So is there, can you be a little more specific in what you mean by memory? I lost you. Okay, oh, you're back, Judy. Yes, I, I, I think you kind of touched upon it. It's a memory that is a knowing. It is a sense, it is a knowing. Yeah, it's not a thought. It's something deeper, right. it's, something, it's something biological. It's not something um, metacognitive. Does that right. It isn't. It isn't. It 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 isn't intellectual. Right. 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 And so, what we're finding, for example, with epigenetics, 
um, you know, that the that we can ex have experiences in our lives that affect us, that affect our parents or grandparents or great grandparents in a way that will be transmitted to the subsequent generations, right? Like one of my favorite examples of this was during the, um, the AIDS epidemic, there were a group of men that were very interesting to scientists. I think Dr. Fauci was one of them. And it was um, like, why are there men who are very sexually active and have been, had partners that have died of, of AIDS, yet they don't become HIV positive and they don't get AIDS. And what they, what they discovered was that the thing that all of these of the group of men shared is that they all had grandparents who survived a famine in um, Scandinavia, two, you know, grandparents. So two generations ago, their grandparents went through this very severe famine. And the famine actually changed the genetics of the grandparents that was passed down. And the, the genes that had changed were linked to the genes related to the receptor sites of the HIV virus, right? And so just haphazardly in a sense, I mean, it, that you would never guess that would be a, a protection from AIDS, but, what, but just sort of at random, you change one gene and you change other genes associated with it. So that served as a protective factor. So I guess when you're talking about genetics, you're talking about those types of memories, right? But like, like we were saying, Judy, it's not a thought. It really is a, a biochemical genetic um, uh, neuroanatomical process that gets altered. Cool. Okay, um, unless I hear another question, I will go on to the next slide. Super quick question while you're transitioning uh, for someone interested in studying generational impact of being an immigrant. Do you have any books or resources they're wondering? Being an immigrant. Um, you know, I, I don't have any book resources, but I have, um, I certainly have seen a lot of articles. If you go to Google Scholar, and scan for that. I'm sure you'll find many, many articles on um, on the the impact of uh, of immigration. Again, immigration can it means so many different things depending on your culture and where you're immigrating from and why. You know, so it's a, it's a very complex topic, um, and there's uh, there's a lot of research in that area. That's just not a, a focus of mine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Doctor, right. work with yeah. some the clients in a ther therapy setting. Um, do you work with family systems such as uh, Bowen or structural? Because Bowen re would refer to this as the multi-generational transmission process. And have you seen it, ha have you been able to work with a family and help them uh, like process what happened to them so it's not occurring in the current family unit that you're working with? Yeah, to, you know, to some degree or another, but you know, Bowen, Murray Bowen was a biologist mm -hmm. and all of his system theory was based on his biological studies. So yeah, he's taking that metaphor, you know, he took the metaphor of how biological organisms are involved in homeostasis related to things like oxygen and glucose, potassium and sodium. And when he looked at family systems, he said, okay, the family is a super organism, right? Mm -hmm. It's an organism that consists of a number of humans, but the homeostatic regulation occurs at the level of anxiety. Yeah. And it's the anxiety that gets people stuck from being able to differentiate from each other. So when I worked with families who are like that, you know, the, the main, the main uh, the first stage really is to diagnose where the, you know, who's, who has the anxiety, then what the source of the anxiety is and how do you work again, how do you work with the family to help people differentiate, help parents get connected, help children to be connected. There are a bunch of different strategic processes that you go through, but with some families, it works really well. And like all therapy with some families, it's a total failure. It really depends on when you get them. Many people wait far too long to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, it's a, it's a, they almost come in on their way to the, on their way to the cemetery. Yes. As opposed to coming in when they start feeling like things are going wrong and getting help right away. So it really, it depends on the family's abilities. Um, their, you know, sort of the ego development across different people. And then, you know, how long they've waited or not waited. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. And so 
this, um, you know, again, this is kind of repeating, this slide sort of repeats, but just expands a little bit, is that the things that get stored in these unconscious systems that shape that 500 millisecond construction of reality are, you know, things like, um, like fears and phobias. They are stored in these primitive systems because the way our nervous systems evol evolved and the way they work. Um, attachment schema um, are another example of that. Our attachment schema begin to form very early, the early months of life, right? And so what an attachment schema is, is it's implicit memory that contains an expectation of the value of those around you to be a safe haven, to be able to decrease your arousal, to make you feel safe, okay? And so in attachment schema, what you're learning in the early, in the early months and years of life is um, how, to, how can you connect with and really utilize other people to make you feel safe? So securely attached children use their parents in that way to help regulate their emotions and make them feel safe. And then there are a variety of other attachment schema where children either um, you know, uh, wall themselves off from their parents. Um, it doesn't mean that they're regulated. It means that their parents don't help them to regulate their emotions. Um, and sometimes when children have parents with unresolved trauma is that the parents themselves are also fr uh, are often frightening and frightened. And so you see this, um, this protection from parents. And so our attachment schema live in us through, you know, through our lives. And there's, there's some consistency throughout life of those early experiences um, of the people we choose, of how we cope with relationships. In other words, do we really have a connection where we rely on other people or do we become the caretakers of other people? Or do we live parallel lives with our partners? All of those things are reflected in um, or are in a sense shaped by um, our early attachment schema. And just to say attachment schema are adaptational patterns. And so they change over time. So if you had difficult attachment early in childhood, if you happen to be lucky enough to get with, you know, get with people that are securely attached, you'll change over time. In the same way, if you're securely attached and you're with people who um, cause you trauma and stress and uncertainty, you'll become insecurely attached. So these things aren't carved in stone, they're adaptational patterns that change over time. Okay. Another thing that's incredibly powerful is shame, right? So shame is a, um, shame is a, we all have shame. I've never met anybody who's not delusional who doesn't have shame, right? And what shame, what shame is, is a, it's a very primitive uh, instinct that was originally designed to, for group cohesion, right? And so in, with social animals, especially with mammals, where there's no language and no written language or no way to make, to how, like they couldn't decide how to organize groups. So what they did with, was shame was, uh, was a way to, for everyone to look at the alpha and to look to the alpha for, um, you know, for direction and control. So just what an alpha is, an alpha is a group organizing principle. In gorillas, it's the, it's the, it's the strongest male. In elephants, it's the oldest, uh, wisest female, right? It isn't about like being big and tough. It really is about what organizing principle helps the group survive, okay? And so now that we have, we've developed and expanded this mind and we have all of this incredible cortical material, shame, you can see the old, the, the early um, uh, origins of shame in how, you know, in bullying, in, in the cliques and crowds of high school and in, in the workplace. And there's a lot of work uh, bullying in the workplace as well. But inside of us, shame manifests as we look at other people and we think we look, we another thing from AA, we compare our inside to other people's outside. And we wonder, are we attractive? Do they like us? What do I do to get them to like me? And that's what, you know, fads are about. And you know, the types of things where people flock after certain, you know, wanting to be a part of something, um, that is a, uh, you know, that's a, a reflection of our primitive shame. So one of the things that's very important in therapy is for me is to educate people 
about the origin of shame, right? Because shame feels so personal and yet it's not, it's not as personal as it feels, right? It's a, it's a mechanism of control from a period in our, in our evolution that we've outgrown. But now we have to figure out, you know, how to, uh, how to behave and minimize it. And a little bit of shame is good. I should be ashamed if when you're not looking, I steal your purse, right? But that's not the type of shame that's problematic. The type of shame that's problematic is those, the things that cripple your ability to, to apply for a job or to apply to a school or to ask someone out on a date or to take a risk because you're certain you're going to fail, right? So shame is an, another thing that's packed into that 500 milliseconds. And so many of us cancel our own vote before we even make any decisions to do things because we're so afraid of being rejected or we don't feel we're cool or we don't feel we're lovable or acceptable, right? So shame started out as this very basic organizing principle for group survival. And now it's become one of the leading causes of psychological distress and suicide and all sorts of things, okay? So that's an important, important thing to keep in mind. And that gets organized very early in life, right? And so again, related to that, Freud's term superego, it's the internalization of the group norms and also self-esteem, right? Do, did we feel that our parents adored us when we looked into their eyes, did they look at us in a way that made us feel like we were part of them? Because for primitive animals, that's how, we sur that's how you survive. And if you don't have parents that you feel adore you, you're, you feel much more frightened and much more vulnerable in the world, okay? And it's very primitive and most people, we don't really have, we don't really have conscious memory of those things, but if you dive deep enough into meditation, um, uh, you know, sort of certain drug experiences, other sorts of uh, therapeutic processes, you start to get down to those layers and then it becomes so clear how central, how central that is, okay? So, you know, again, I'm making a case for the, uh, for that uh, incredibly vital half second where our, our brains uh, create and structure what is presented to our minds as reality. This is a wonderful quote by the Spanish uh, poet Ortega Gasset. He says, he said very rightly, we do not live to think. We think in order that we may succeed in surviving. And so what this, what this implies is that um, we tend to think of ourselves as rational beings, right? But we're really not rational beings, right? We, what we are is we, um, what we strive to do is to believe, right? Believing was the glue that helped, that held tribes together. Believing is the glue that holds Trump's people together and QAnon and all of these things we're dealing with now, right? They believe the most wacky things, right? But the belief is more powerful than the data. And people on the news are always saying, well, why, how can they possibly believe this stuff? Because the human brain is more vulnerable to belief. And that, you know, that's why we have all sorts of cults, you know, and all kinds of things that emerge in, in this way where people, you know, commit group suicide, march into battle, do all of these things because we have the, the experience as an individual, but there's part of our brain that has that primitive paleolithic connection to the mob. And when we're in a mob, we're different, we're different than we are when we're individuals, right? And belief is the glue of the mob, right? And you see that uh, what people are willing to do in the name of their God and how two armies can go into battle, both believing that God is on their side and both believing there's only one God, right? So that's kind of the primitive glue and, uh, you know, that, that keeps, that has kept groups together, okay? So you can see from, from what I'm saying, this might paint a bleak picture, but I think just the fact that all of you are interested in expanding your consciousness means that we may be at a critical point in evolution, right? Where we have to look at, and I think I, I see this a lot too in the Black Lives Matter movement. We've been you know, behaving on, this, um, on distortions and lies and 
disrespect and subjugation, you know, for centuries. And we've got to get, we've got to wake up to these realities and we have to take responsibility for changing these things and for changing our attitudes about them. And I think if we don't, you know, I don't think we'll survive, but I think if we do, we, I think we have the capability to. The question is, do we, do we, do we have the time and do we have the will? So this, this uh, one of the things you see is there are all of these distortions in our perspective. In other words, and social psychology has studied this for a century, and there are thousands of papers on this. In other words, why do we, if, um, if someone else does something that, um, if, something else ha if someone else has a problem, we tend to attribute it to their character. If the same thing happens to us, we attribute it to the situation. Our brains naturally label other people. We, our brains automatically try to lump people into groups, right? We try to cat, and that is a shorthand. That was a shorthand created by evolution so that we can make rapid decisions about other people because we might have to either fight or run or freeze or do something, right? And we still have that, that still remains. We're, we're, we're only half civilized. The other half of our, our brains are still in the savanna or back in the deep jungle. So just to put this another way, the brain is an organ of adaptation. And I've said this before in different ways, but we learn from experience. We need to anticipate the future, right? We organize preloaded responses. So what I, and it's another way of saying in that half a second, our brain looks on the shelf of all the similar situations and we respond to things as if they were the things that already happened, right? And then that's how we optimize survival. So think if you've ever had a bad relationship with someone um, and in the next relationship, we find ourselves continuing to act as if the person we're with was that person. Or if we had a difficult relationship with one of our parents, right? We're, in, we're married or we're in a relationship and we keep expecting that the other person to be the, diff, the parent we had trouble with and we keep dealing with them as if they're that other person and they might tell you, hey, I'm not your mother, I'm not your father. You're acting as if I'm them. And you go, yeah, I get that. But then what you end up doing reflexively in that half second is this, pre -or this organized preloaded response gets activated and you do it again and again. And it takes lots and lots of repetitions. So you have to have a very patient partner to uh, tolerate your growth in that process. And I think it's the same thing in prejudice. I did a, um, yesterday I was a, a student in a, um, you know, in a diversity conference and people were talking about all the dumb things that old white guys like myself say to their African-American friends that drive their African-American friends crazy. And I was sitting there going, going, God, yes, did that, did that, did that. It's like, oh my God, you know, it's just like humiliation time. But, and I'll probably do some of those things again, but the more I learn and the more I focus, the less likely I am to do it. And that really is the process. And that goes back again to the free won't. I'm wondering, should I stop here? I, I also have the question, are we going till 8.30 or nine? I believe we have you for the hour, but as we've done in the past, you're welcome to stay as long as you're willing to stay. And if people need to jump off, they can. And if okay. they want to stay. That's cool. I, you know, I don't want to keep anyone up <laughs> if you're, or if, you know, away from your wine if it's wine time. Oh, no. No, this is compelling. Thank you so much. Okay, good. So I'll continue for a little while longer until I don't see anybody on my screen anymore. Sure, we'll cut you off at nine just to All right, good. finally. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. So again, going back to like what the purpose of this, the purpose of the way our brains work and coming to these rapid decisions is we have to make fast decisions. Our perception are distorted to support social bonds. So we, send, we tend to think our, our guys, our, the, our team is better than the other team, our ethnicity, our family, all of, you know, whatever is on our side is better, right? It was interesting, I read this study um, recently about um, not, uh, soldiers, German soldiers during World War II. 
And the, the question from the researchers was, how could you follow such a deranged leader, right? Like what, are you, are you people inhuman? And what they found across the board was the soldiers weren't fighting for Hitler. The soldiers were fighting for the other soldiers who were their friends in the foxholes, right? There's this, um, there's this organ, the organization, the group, the family is a very powerful, compelling item, right? It's like you, you die without question for your children. You push them out of the way and you get hit by the car. Now, if it's, if it's your spouse, it might depend on the day, like what mood you're in. But if it's your children, boom, you know, you're right there to, uh, you know, to do it. And so we're wired this way. We're wired to, I mean, a, an evolutionist would say we're wired to protect the genes, our genes, whether they're in our body or in our children's bodies, right? So another thing that this does is we have this will to certainty. We like to believe we know the right answer. People want to believe that the Clintons killed John Kennedy Jr., you know, like sabotaged his plane. What it does is it, the stories that we believe make us, make the world make sense to us based on our basic beliefs. So once you have a basic belief, you just start accumulating whatever information supports your belief that reduces your anxiety, right? And it makes you feel more competent. That's why people who are so wrong and so dumb seem so certain, right? That's, that's the way it is. You stop questioning. Our brains evolve to believe not to know, right? So it feels good to, it feels good to know and it feels good to be on the inside of the conspiracy theory and know what the truth is about everything. And this is one of my favorite co uh, quotes in the world uh, by a fellow named Martin Amos, who's a writer. He said, man is only fitfully committed to thinking, seeing, learning, and knowing. Believing is what he is really proud of, okay? So when you think about it, what we're trying to do in yoga and therapy and meditation and the other practices that we, we uh, you know, dedicate ourselves to is we're trying to, to counteract this. We're trying to think and see and learn and know and be open to being wrong constantly, right? Because the, everything is a hypothesis. Our, brain, our brains don't work in, in absolute facts. They work in um, degrees of belief that have more or less data supporting them. So one of the things that, um, again, I've talked about this before, um, we, consciousness was constructed in a way for, to, to uh, create the illusion that we live in the present moment, right? Which makes sense. If you've ever watched a movie where the soundtrack and the picture are out of sync, right? It's like, it, it makes you a little crazy. You can imagine if you were felt like you were on a, like a, a half a second delay in your life, like everything was hitting you half a second before, after you experienced it, wouldn't make any sense at all. So the way our minds and our brains have organized their experience, it creates the illusion of living in the moment. Right? Again, this is from a, I don't think this is a Buddhist idea. This is more just based on what the neuroscience shows us, right? Or, or strongly suggests. We also experience ourselves as located behind our eyes. So we think of ourselves as living in our brain behind our eyes. But why? Why our brains? You know, the Romans used to think that our mind was in our heart, right? Um, if you do, if you do any kind of somatic practice, or, you know, or, or bodily practice, you realize your consciousness can be anywhere, okay? But it makes sense that we experience ourselves behind our eyes because of the importance for humans of hand-eye coordination, throwing objects, catching things, picking up our children, so our minds construct the illusion that we're up here because vision, um, vision took over from smell from more primitive mammals. Like we evolved, um, you know, about 50,000 years ago after the asteroid hit, the only mammals that survived were mammals that lived underground like moles and shrews and things like that. So those are our ancestors, right? Black before we were primates and all. And so the, um, those animals depended a lot on smell because they lived underground, they couldn't see very much and their nose really was their, their eyes and ears and everything, right? But as 
we grew as we expanded, as we lived on the surface, and as we stood upright, vision became more and more important to the point where now in the human brain, a huge part of the brain is dedicated to vision and much less to smell, okay? But you're, if you have a dog, you know, if you're walking your dog, you know how your dog loves to like hang their head out the window when you're driving and sniff or they're always smelling everything? Half of the front of the dog's brain is dedicated to smell. So when they're smelling the tree or the, or the, the, uh, the fire hydrant, they know all the dogs in the neighborhood, what they're doing, who they're fooling around with, what they had for lunch, right? There's a huge amount of information dogs are picking up through smell and we don't have a clue about any of those things. All we can say is it stinks, right? <laughs> so it's get away from there, it stinks. But that's the dogs, that's a, a fire hydrant is a people magazine for a dog because of how their brains are organized, right? And that's why they're used at the airports to de you know, detect marijuana and other drugs. There are even dogs now that can sense when someone's about to have a seizure. So there are people who, you know, who have uh, service dogs, if they have epilepsy, to warn them they're having a seizure. So they lay down on the ground before they lose consciousness, right? So the, 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 the hand I stretch that, experience our lives from the, from the focus, uh, from the point of view of what we're seeing has, is something that's evolved as vision has become so important for us. Again, it's a construction, okay? It's something we take for granted, but it's, a, it's construction. We also believe that we possess free will and that we also, and that we have all of two available to us, all the information we need. And that's a real easy thing to pull, you know, to undermine because all of us do things like how many of us wish we could lose a few pounds and how many of us keep buying ice cream when we go to the market? Right. So you really have free will. I, you know, I want to have a conversation with you about that. I'll meet you at I'll meet you at Gelson's in the freezer department and we can talk about that. Okay. okay. And so when you think about that, though, the fact that we feel like we have free will and that we have all the information allows us to act and behave and assert ourselves, which probably correlated with survival and has correlated with survival. Okay. And this other thing is that we've evolved the sense of a separate and consistent identity. And I think that certainly the Buddhists among you would question that, and certainly Buddha did, right? And so we're both a part of the group, right? And we also experience ourselves as an individual. Um, we each have a different degree of the sense of separateness and connectedness. And also, depending on which culture you were raised in, you also have a different sense of how much you're connected to other people and how much autonomy you have. You know, and as I've done therapy over the years and made all the, all the mistakes you can make working with different ethnic groups and different, from different classes, from different societies, where people have completely different views of their individuality, I've had to learn over time to not assume anything about that and really to be quiet and learn and ask and um, have someone teach me about their experience and their culture and their beliefs before I, you know, uh, go headlong into any kind of an intervention that would make sense for me, right, but not necessarily for them. Uh, let me take another break at this point if anyone has any uh, thoughts or questions. Uh, I was just going to mention your uh, your comment about smell, and I was reading some articles and listening to some interviews about with COVID and people losing their sense of smell. It mm -hmm. has really brought so much attention to the fact of how much we love our smell and how much we depend on it. Oh, yeah. And I was even um, learning that there are certain things that humans can smell that dogs can't smell that Ooh, that like are. I, they didn't say what it was. Oh, okay. It actually said that our, it, it's kind of, um, it was a woman who studies, and I forget the name of the term, but she herself can, has never been able to smell. So mm -hmm. she studies that. And since COVID now, it's a huge, like there's many support groups mm -hmm. from people who can't smell and how it's affecting them psychologically. So yeah. I just thought, thought it was really interesting because we do depend so much on sight mm -hmm. uh, and, we, and we don't really, um, think so much about smell and how important it is to our well-being and our emotions and how, you know, around us, like when we're eating, when we smell things. So, so anyway, I, I just thought that was a, an interesting thing that's happening now yeah, uh, yeah. in light of the pandemic. It really is. I mean, you know, the, when you 
So you talk about this a little bit more. I mean, I think sight became in humans the predominant sense of navigating the environment and and you know sort of assisting us in survival. But smell hung on. I mean, if you um, the if if you if you I don't know if you have you ever done a brain dissection. But if you what what you what happens is that up in if I could take my the top of my head off and lift my brain up to show you the bottom of the front of my brain, what you would see on the bottom are these two very little um, these like it's almost like little shoelace size uh, projections that go from the middle of our brain over our sinuses like so under here that are above our sinuses that pick up the chemicals that we in, we inhale right. And those senses go right to this primitive core part of our brain related to, you know, nutrition and relationships, right? And so you think about, um, you think about like, what's the earliest connection between a, a, a child mammal and their mothers? It's, you know, it's nursing. The very word mammal is, comes from breasts, right? And so the, and you think too about like eating disorders and anorexia and things like that, where it, it often expresses this need to be independent and create the boundary there. So nurturance and, and attachment and love are very closely interwoven. And of course, um, you know, we spend, you know, we, humans don't seem to have very many pheromonal communications anymore, like, like insects do and more primitive animals, but we spend billions of dollars every year on deodorants, right? And we also spend billions of dollars every year on perfumes and colognes and things like that. And if and most of us have a, you know, from our from our childhoods or from growing up, we have memories of all of these smells related to cooking and related to the, you know, the, the particular smells of our background. And you get you get one of those smells and it just brings you back, right? So smell is very much there, but it's not so much nav it's not so much involved anymore with the world or uh, navigating the environment. It's more the regulation of the internal experience and the experience close to us. So what do the people we hold smell like, right? I remember when my when my baby was born, I couldn't believe how wonderful it was to smell his head. You know, he had that like that hot little head and that little baby sweat. And I'd hold him and just smell his head. And it was like, why is this so wonderful? But it's, you know, it's part of that attachment and bonding. It may still be related to pheromones at some degree, like bonding and attachment. Babies can tell the smell of their mothers. You know, they can, they can, they'll orient to the smell of their mothers versus the smell of a, you know, of, of another, of another woman, say. So it's all there, but it's, it's focused on a very different level of experience. And I mean, you. When, you, when you get to be my age, eating is like the major thing and you, and you can't really enjoy food without smelling it, you know? I'm sorry, Sandra, I interrupted you. No, I was just saying thank, thank you because I find it very, uh, I find it very interesting and just thinking about our senses and our dependence on sight. And when mm -hmm. we're meditating, we close our eyes, right? And we try to give more attention to the other senses which are often overlooked mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right one of one of the most difficult things i'm thinking about you know a training because i've been teaching psychotherapy for longer than i can remember and one of the things that therapists always start out with is they they think that they've got to learn all this information because what what helps other people in therapy is coming up with a smart response and saying the right or clever thing and what happens is they're so they they live completely up above their eyes, and they don't they don't have a sense of the fact that your my, your body is like a radar dish, and you're vibrating with the people that you're with. And I don't mean to get too la woo woo about this, but I do believe that through all sorts of mirror processing that I can you know back up with with neurological evidence, right? That we're always picking up all kinds of messages like the. The synapse, the social synapse, is incredibly has an incredibly wide bandwidth, and so one of the things I really work with uh, with my students is to try to allow to help them get back in their bodies, and to be able to start paying attention to what's going on in their bodies as a way to possibly 
gain information about their client. Because if you're with someone, that other person is going to have an impact on your, your heart, on your, on your breathing, on your posture. Um, you're going to imitate their posture even subtly, and that will give you information about their internal state, right? So, and once students get that, and of course, I think with, with yoga folks, that's not, I'm preaching to the choir, right? But once, once therapists get that, it's almost like they discover a whole new, there's like a whole nother, um, uh, you know, toolbox that they have to work with. And they also find that they feel more grounded and centered in the therapy. And the therapy isn't as taxing because they're not running their, th it's not that they're running their thinking all the time, but they're actually able to relax into the relationship and breathe and connect and be patient with themselves. Yeah, any, anyone else? Lorena, I've been, I've see, I see you up there. You have a wonderful smile and you're wondering what's, what's going on in the head of yours. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm not part of the yoga program or anything. I just, I have taken, um, I have been to Loyola for lectures and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, I find this fascinating. And I actually had, um, I was just wondering, I read a book uh, titled, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh -huh. And I was thinking as you were sharing about, you know, conscious, uh, consciousness and all in the brain. So everything that you talked about was like based on the brain. And I was wondering if uh, consciousness is also um, like in the body, like not only in the brain, but, you know, through the body, we also gain consciousness or it yeah. develops in the body somehow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great question, and of course, I think people. I don't think we're absolutely. I don't think we know. First of all, um, I think that uh, at least, given my limited understanding, in order for us to be aware of anything, it has to come up here somehow. But the I don't. You, you, when you think about the brain you may not want to think about the brain as just being in the head, but the brain being the entire nervous system, mm. right? So like when Bessel van der Kolk talks about the body keeping the score, mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, I've had clients who have been, had horrible experiences and I notice little subtle body movements while, you know, while they're talking about something else. And I say, could I see that you're doing, could you exaggerate that? Can you do that a little bit more? Yeah. And that, that bodily movement is a small part of their defensive reaction from the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, I guess the way I see that, it's, it's kind of like a door or a window to discovering that part of the memory, you know, that part of the experience and maybe the, the string to pull the rest of the memory out. But whether or not it's in the body or in the, in the motor strip here that controls this, I don't think we really know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not like we're starfish, like, or, or animals where like a worm, if you cut it in half, both halves keep moving, right? Um, it may be that we depend a lot on our brain. So what best, I mean, mm. like a Bessel van der Kolk is a friend of mine, you know, and he said the, um, he said, yeah, the, um, he said the book, the book is not so great, but it has a great title. He says, <laughs> I've, I've sold millions of copies of that book because the title's so damn good. The book's all right, right? But the, but the title's great. So I think the title is very catchy and sexy, but it's not really clear if it's accurate, right? And again, I don't know whether it's accurate or not. I just, I just sharing with you, that's the debate, that's the question. So it might just be when you say that I have memories in my body, it might just be kind of a shorthand to say that I access those memories by being aware of tensions. You know, there's a, there's a fellow you might be interested in on, called with Wilhelm Reich. R-E-I-C-H, and he was, um, he was one of Freud's disciples. Mm. And he was the father of Gestalt therapy and somatic therapies. And he wrote a book called Character Analysis. And the mm. first half of that book, he describes his work with clients. Like he used to see clients in analysis, but he would have them wear bathing suits because what he wanted to, what he wanted to watch was their musculature as they were talking about their lives. 
So he was listening to their words and he was watching their, their skeletal reaction to see whether he could see evidence or clues for memories or feelings that were being dissociated from consciousness, but were being betrayed or there was a tell somewhere in the body. So fascinating stuff. Absolutely. And yeah. I have been, um, you know, it seems like therapy has never worked for me mm -hmm. in that sense, because like there's nothing conscious that I can work on. It's mostly I feel it in my body. Like I feel mm -hmm. that like a knowing, like someone said before, mm -hmm. and not with mem like thoughts, not something that I can remember or anything, but there's a knowing yeah. uh, in me that I experienced abuse. Yeah. I, I don't have memory of it, but I know yeah. it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing too. It, it, it might be something you experienced. It might be something your mother experienced or your grandmother. That, experienced. That's another thing that I yeah. have been looking into. And it, maybe that's what it is. I'm, I'm yeah. starting to, to think that, yeah, that might be the reason. Well, we, when it, you know, I, I don't know what the statistics are, the current statistics, but from the last research I read, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, is that a very large majority of women, you know, and girls experience frightening sexual approaches in, in one way or another. Um, and also, um, a lot of that stuff gets repressed or normalized, but emotionally, it still feels, there's still the terror there. Mm -hmm. And if you think about a mother, uh, uh, like if you think about your generation, your mother and your grandmother, it's probably, I would say it's almost a certainty that one of the three of you, you know, if not all three of you have had experiences like that. And so we can, we can search what, I, what I've, you know, just what I've experienced over the years is you can search for the episode and you can rack your brain to try to remember what the thing is, but, or the incident, but it might not be there. And if it is, it might not be available, but I don't think it's that important, right? I think what's important is that, like what, what Bessel says, your body remembers the violation, is associated with the fear, and maybe it has a symptomatic effects on you, like, you know, being timid or shy or avoiding things that you need, you need to have a bigger voice, but you keep quiet. So I you know if you were in therapy with me, those are the things I would work on, not spending countless hours trying to find out who did it or what happened. Mm, you know exactly. what I'm saying? Yes, yeah. thank you so much for that. Really. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. I, re I very much appreciate it. Oh, it's good to yeah. uh, nice to meet you. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. something that I had it has it had been puzzling me for so long, but I think this is <laughs> Kind of like a, a signal. Okay, let it go. It just work with with what you can work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, Lorena. Good luck with it. Yeah. yeah. Iana, I see your hand up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to kind of excuse me. Yes, thank you, Iana. Um, just to kind of speak to that. One thing that I've been studying, I, I've I've been doing birth work training and specifically looking at the African-American community with women specifically, they've been doing a lot of research on generational trauma and transgenerational trauma uh -huh. and how those memories of um, past traumas are stored in the body. Um, and so just one simple thing we talked, they, one of our instructors was talking about how, you know, when you think about a woman and her body developing, the eggs that are in your body are developing when you're in the womb. So if that development is happening each maternal generation, your, your, that body, that source, that egg is still holding on to that trauma. And they're, they're seeing signs of that uh, in the research that they've been doing. And I'll have to go back and, and, and pull, um, the doctor's uh, study and, and some of her, her research materials. And Amy, I can send them to you because I don't have them on hand, but they are doing quite a bit of research on that transgenerational trauma and that storing of some type of memory or something in the body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the idea is fascinating. Unfortunately, so far, because I, I recently read that book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, 
the Gru's book. Are you familiar with that one? And she, yeah, it's a really interesting book. And she refers to that same phenomena, um, but it really is all meta, it's more metaphorical. We really, we, we have to figure out what the mechanism is that like, what's the biological mechanism? Because to say that the trauma gets into the egg is more, it, it's sort of a, it's a, it's sort of a story, but it doesn't necessarily, how does it get into the egg? And what form does it take in the egg, you know? And I think um, we don't know that that happens yet. I wouldn't be surprised if it does, right? And I think it, it would be, you know, when you think about the transgenerational impact of, of genocide, of the Holocaust, of slavery, of these horrible, horrible things where our ancestors had to suffer and suffered so much. Um, and now that we've got this understanding of epigenetics that those things do affect our genes, we absolutely have to explore that. But I think also we have to be careful not to make, you know, not to make big jumps or big decisions about it yet. I think we have to be patient, but stay very curious. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's really important. Amy, I see you've joined us again. I think you have something to say. <laughs> Well, we are winding down here. Okay. If there's one last burning question. All right. We can take that and then we'll sign off. Okay. Who's burning? <laughs> Thank you, Ayana. That was great. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess no one else is burning. Everyone's tired. They're mild <laughs> to moderate, not burning. <laughs> They're on simmer. Well, thank all of you guys. I really appreciate uh, uh, spending this time with you. And thanks for your wonderful questions, too. Thank you. Thank you for spending the extra time. Oh, my pleasure. Myself and maybe others. It was just really nice to connect during Same the kind of locked down time. So mm -hmm. be well. Did you hear from Chris? Is he in the light yet? I believe he's here. He's probably just hearing us and okay. frustrated that he can't contribute. Okay. <laughs> I think he's here by phone. Chris, if you hear me, if you need candles, call me. I'll bring some over. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the right, abyss. Everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. Stay well. Take care. And we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye.